The following interview was conducted with Teresa Brown for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on December 19, 2017 at Purdue Archives and Special Collections in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Adriana Harmeyer. So to get us started, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from? Okay. Early years? Um, I grew up in Attica, which is about 30 miles from, from campus. Um, <clears throat> I'm one of six children, um, fourth in line, and the fifth to attend Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, my oldest sibling went to IU, so we don't mention him too much, but <laughs> the rest of us were all here at Purdue. Um, my sister um, started working at Purdue in 1968, after she graduated. And in 69, she took a job in the Civil Engineering Library. And I would come up and spend a couple days or a couple weeks with her during the summer. And so I would come to work with her. And so that's how I first came to know about the Purdue Libraries. Okay. So when you came to Purdue as a student, what was your connection with the libraries then? How did you build that connection yourself? Okay, well, um, <clears throat> I came to Purdue in 1973 as a freshman. Um, and again, because my sister was already involved in the Civil Engineering Library, working for Ed Posey, um, and I was here on scholarship, but needed a job to make ends meet. Um, I interviewed with Mr. Posey, and he said if I was willing to work in one of the other libraries um, that he would be happy to have me, because he knew me from spending summers up here with my sister, so he knew. Plus, um, my brother Greg and uh, a really good friend of ours were also working in the libraries at the same time, so I think he knew what he was getting <laughs> when he said, we'll hire you. So I started out in the Kim Met Library and um, working under Dick McIntyre's supervision. And from there, I guess I kind of grew a reputation. <laughs> I don't know. But I worked in all of the six engineering libraries at one point, which would be um, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, Kim Met, nuclear engineering, civil engineering, and I'm forgetting one. Oh, um, Arrow. Aeronautical engineering. Um, and even if I didn't have regularly scheduled hours in there, um, I would substitute a lot in those libraries for students who called in sick or couldn't come in. And at that time, I also evidently had a reputation, I guess. <laughs> um, I did a lot of special projects um, for Mr. Posey at that time. They were looking at combining those six engineering libraries into Potter. Um, the building had not been built yet, so there was still all that planning to go on. Um, but I also would substitute in um, a lot of the other uh, individual libraries, chemistry, math sciences, home ec library, which was later CFS, the psychology library, earth and atmospheric sciences library. Um, I helped out in pharmacy a couple times, um, vet med. So I kind of hit them all. <laughs> so... So I really had a strong sense of what the library was about um, and um, a, an interesting story is though I, I worked in the libraries but when I had my um, major was creative arts and so most of the books and things that I needed were here in Hissey Library um, and at that time there was a desk, information desk, on each floor of the libraries. And I can remember just thinking, these librarians are scary. <laughs> and I just thought it was strange because I worked in the libraries and knew all these people, but I really didn't have that relationship with the Hissey Library, you know, because I, I worked in all the other libraries. Mm -hmm. So, I, but I can remember thinking, okay, these people, this is scary. You know, it was hard to go and ask them questions for reference help, but, you know, something that you learn to get used to and and evolve from there. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, that's how I wound up being in the library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so did you get a sense as a student that you might want to work for the libraries after you graduated? I, You know, I really didn't. My degree was in um, art education, and so my goal was I was certified to teach K through 12 art, and, um, but I 
got married my junior year of school here. I married um, a, a, a guy that I grew up with at home. And um, so I wanted to stay in this area because his – so and jo- teaching jobs in this area were very slim and few and far between, especially in, you know, art. And um, so after I graduated in the summer of 77 – and um, looked for jobs and, and d- couldn't get a teaching job. So I did a lot of substitute teaching locally and back home in Attica and, and around the area. And um, so when, as jobs opened up within the libraries, full-time jobs, then um, I kind of looked at those and decided, okay, I well, we bought a house. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I need a job. So... Um, I came, it was interesting because I came to interview for a clerical position in the chemistry library with John Pinselig. And John knew me from my undergraduate because uh, I had helped over there as well on a couple projects. And it, John was an interesting person. Um, he liked graduate students and researchers to use his library. He didn't particularly like the undergrads to be in there. Um, <laughs> so. But when I interviewed with him, he said, Teresa, I would love to have you, but I think you would be here three months and then you would want to move on. Because he said, You're, you already know how this all works and there's nothing really new here and challenging for you. So I was really kind of disappointed, but I thought, well, okay, you know, if he doesn't think, you know, I'd be happy and be there long term. So then the um, reserve book clerk in the life sciences library had a position that was open and I interviewed with Ruth All who was the head librarian at that time in life sciences for that position and she hired me um, and so that's when I really started my full time um, position and that would have, that was January 11th 1978 okay so yes um and worked with um, a lot of the staff here at that time, knew Marianne Day Eldridge, and she was the reserve clerk, and I was the circulation clerk, and we had a blast. We had a really good time working together, and got to know the staff in and, and the building, and um, it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How long yeah. were you in that position? Uh, okay, so I was in that position about a year and a half, and then... Mary Ann left to come over to Hissy to the reserve book room, and biochemistry, the woman who had worked over there, retired. And so biochemistry was part of the life sciences, uh, fell under the head librarian there. And so they needed someone in biochemistry. So I volunteered, more or less, to go over there and be the, the clerk over there. And so I was in biochemistry for probably nine months. Um, it was a, it, it was one of these one room little libraries, um, and I enjoyed it, but the frustrating part was the grad students and the faculty, they all had keys to the library. Ooh. So when I would come in on Monday morning, it was just an absolute nightmare trying to put it all back together. Um, so, um, then Mary Ann, when she left, she came over here to re, um, the reserve book room as the, the supervisor. And so she had a position that opened up. So I interviewed for that position and then moved um, over to the reserve book room in Hesse Library. And I was probably there a couple of years. Um, and then there's an interesting side story, so I won't go into all the details because they probably wouldn't like it. But Life Sciences then had a position that opened up um, that would have been, it was a job level um, up from what I was here. And um, so I went over there and I was over there back again as a level four. Um, I don't remember for how long I was before I came back to... Stewart Center into the film library Um, and when I was in the film library I was the um, uh, the media at that time it was interesting because they had beta tapes but they were moving to three quarter inch video cassettes 
and um, and then the 16 millimeter films and tape cassettes and slide sets and yeah, just it, all types of media. Um, and so I was the cataloger for the media. Um, and in 82, 1982, the Hicks undergraduate library was completed, and so we moved the um, film library and the instructional media center into the new Hicks building. And so um, I helped put furniture together in that building. <laughs> So, and I joked with Mr. Moses, David Moses, about um, having the one stairwell named after me <laughs> at that time. It was a big joke between me and I. So, um, and uh, so I was I was in Hicks undergraduate from 1982 until I moved upstairs into Stewart Center um, in 2000. Um, it would have been maybe 2010 or 9. Um, they made me move, and I wasn't sure I could handle it, but because <laughs> I'd been underground so long, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, I always joked with Mr. Moses about the furniture in undergrad because they were this individual study carols, and they had white Formica tops. And I said to him, I said, who is the idiot that picked out these cat they, you know, this and he looked at me and he goes, What do you mean? And I said, Mr. Moses, this is just an invitation for students to draw and write. And he's like, Well, they wouldn't do that. This is a new building. And I'm like, uh, have you ever been in the stacks? And it's he, he's like, Oh, okay. But anyway, we got along great. Mm -hmm. Um so in I did media cataloging, and I helped in the Instructional Media Center, and then I also kind of served as a backup for um, storage, which is now the Hicks Repository. Um, Dot Lanzalotta was down there, and, and several people through the years, but um, we were right next door to each other, and at that time we had media that was packaged and sent out to classrooms for classroom instruction, and so we would have to box it up and send it out with the carrier, um, the audiovisual center, so that it would go to that classroom, and um, they would show the film, and then we'd get it back and do all that process, and, and DOT was part of that process, too, um, and then retrieving books, and um, we did a lot of fun things during the summer down there. We would have um, the Olympics, the uh, Hicks Undergraduate Library Olympics, so the, the basement floor um, would challenge the main floor to different events, and we would have book cart races and, you know, see who could shell books the fastest. Or um, So we did a lot of fun things um, mm -hmm. over the summer months when we weren't really busy and um, helped you know, bridge that between us and them. And, mm -hmm. um, it, it was really a good, good thing. Sounds like fun. Yeah, it was. We had a good time. We were kind of goofy, but, but we had a good time. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we got our jobs done and did them well and um, you know, received different awards from different places across campus at, you know, for what we did. And, mm -hmm. um, so we knew we were doing something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so it was fun. So um, then in 1992... I um, got remarried, and my husband is a farmer, and he was like, okay, I really would like for you to go to a part-time position, and it was at that time that we were, libraries were was working on their new strategic plan, this, it was a whole new thing, and kind of restructuring how um, the libraries could integrate and work more together instead of, you know, being us, them, and hours and whatever, um, you know, trying to set the same checkout um, length of times so the libraries was consistent within and, and the overdues and because everybody kind of had their own policy at that time and so it was a little confusing um, if you had to, if you were in one library and had to go to another library to get your stuff but their policy was different and it was a little confusing mm -hmm. so so Emily Mobley was was the dean at the time and so we were looking at how to restructure libraries into a more unified unit um, 
and because I was getting married, um, one of the suggestions was that we do um, an internal communication newsletter, whatever. Um, and so Emily really took that to heart. And so she, at that time, I was still writing um, descriptions for um, media. And so she approached me and said, you know, would you be interested in taking on this role as um, editor of our newsletter um, and, and making a, a part-time position, a 20-hour week position? And, of course, I said, well, I'd like to try. Um, so that's how I went from the media film library to um, editor of our staff newsletter. Um, and in August of 2018, it will be 25 years. So I've been, been doing the newsletter for almost 25 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's evolved. Yeah. <laughs> it's in a whole other <laughs> thing from, you know, going to paper copy to an electronic version. And um, it's been a real challenge. It's one I've loved because it's given me the opportunity to meet staff. I mean, I, you know, I get to know who people are. You know, we highlight the new staff and, and what they do. Um, and then slowly the, the photography thing is the electronic photography came into being. Um, that became another part of the job um, so that we could document and highlight events and staff and, and whatever. So, um, so, yeah, so it's been a real real learning adventure <laughs> so and it's yeah. always been just you doing that yes it has always been me um when i first started doing the newsletter i reported directly to the dean uh emily mobley and um then when she left when she retired and jim came in um they had me report to Tom Hayworth, who was the personnel director, which was a little odd, but anyway, that's how it all kind of went. And then um, Jim looked at it, reevaluated it, and they decided that a better place for me to report to would be our um, director of advancement, and um, that was Judy Shoemaker at the time. And um, and then she slowly added on to her staff. Um, so that's how I wound up upstairs um, when the Archives and Special Collections opened up and Katie Marquis moved from Stewart C downstairs Stewart Center to up here. They were like, okay, we have room for Teresa. So that's when they made me leave undergrad. And really, it, it worked out well because, I mean, it just made more sense. Um, so... Um, let's see, Judy left, and then, uh, who came after Judy? Da, 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 Sandy. Sandy Howarth came, and then, uh, now it is Catherine Dilworth. Um, but as that kind of all evolved and how their thing, then my reporting structure changed as well. Um, they created a, a director of communications. Um, so there was Kayla Gregory, and then there was, um, yeah, uh, Kate, 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 Kate Kester, and then after Kate was, uh, Shannon Walker, and now it's Teresa Kaltzenberg, um, so yeah, so I've outlived them all. <laughs> well, I won't say outlived, but I've outlasted all of them, so, so yeah. So um, it's been a great, great adventure, and you learn a lot. And um, technology, I had to, you know, the technology part of it was kind of a challenge because I'm old. <laughs> I'm like, okay, do I really want to do this? Um, so yeah, and I, I, it's the job has kept me young at heart. Mm -hmm. I believe, you know, because you're interacting with. I don't interact with the students as much, but. Um, you know, now I'm interacting with the staff, of course, and then when we have special events, our distinguished lecture series. I mean, you know, like we've met Neil Armstrong, Eugene Cernan, um, you know, Amy Tan, um, you know, just people that you, you think, how 
did I get here? Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's been it's been a great, great experience. Mm -hmm. It really has. It's always some interesting, unexpected job perks. Right? Yes, yes, uh -huh. absolutely, absolutely. And is it because of the newsletter that you kind of became the department photographer? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, because that was not my valley wick at all. It used to be I when I would come and meet new staff and to take their photo and and I would always say, okay, now these are not Olin Mill quality photos, and the younger staff would look at me like what are you talking about and then I realized okay they don't know what Olin Mills is <laughs> they don't know who you know that they were a professional photography company you know that went around door to door and took pictures and stuff so um but yeah the photography thing developed because of the newsletter mm -hmm. so yeah okay. it's been fun I know you've had a lot of great experiences. Are there any particular memories that stand out as you think back about everything you've done in the libraries? Oh, man. Um, I, like I you know, mentioned, meeting famous authors and astronauts and that type of thing. Um, and really just getting to know, you know, the presidents at Purdue, um, you know, Bering and Jiski and... Um, Hansen was, was the president when I was a student, um, you know, and, and Cor Franz Cordova and Mitch Daniels. It, it, it blows me away whenever I see him because he, he knows who I am. I mean, he calls me by name, and I'm like, okay, but anyway. Um, so that's, you know, it's just been a great opportunity to see how the university works. It gives you a better understanding of, you know, the different levels and the different tiers and why things don't happen like we think they should, you know, or as quickly as we think they should. Um, I'm trying to think within the libraries, you know, I mentioned our Summer Olympics and some of the fun and crazy things um, that we would do. I would have to say one of the most unusual things that, that we did was in Life Sciences Library, um, Marianne and I, we had a really good time. I mean, we got a lot done, but we had a good time. But at the end of one of the semesters, um, you know, everybody's running in and trying to return late books and overdue books. And that was before they had a fine system. So people really didn't care <laughs> if they got them back in time, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It was the last couple of days of the semester, and, and it was mostly grad students and professors still left in the libraries. And we had a book drop that... You drop the book in, and you could open the door and pull the card out, you know, and empty the books. And so, I, what inspired us, I have no idea. But I crawled in the book drop thing, and we shut the door. So when people put their books in, I slid them back out. And I mean, it was absolutely hysterical. People were so confused. And I, I don't know, we had a great time doing that. They, they kind of thought, what in the world? And then they realized what was going on. So, so that was... Um, a lot of fun. You know, we worked really, really hard, um, but we also made it fun and enjoyable, and, and I think that our users who came in um, appreciated the fact that, you know, it, it, was a good, it was an enjoyable place to come. I mean, that's what we tried to, to make each place that we, we um, where I worked, and um, where I always had really great co-workers. I mean, I, I can't complain about I've been very, very fortunate with the people that I work with. Very fortunate. Um, now, whether they'd say the same about me, I don't know. <laughs> but I've had a good time with them. So, um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I can remember I, when I was a student, I can remember um, Vietnam War when it you know, came to a close um, in 75. And... I had a cousin who was there um, for a long, long time, and you know I remember him coming home, and then he came to Purdue on the GI Bill, and, and that was a really big, um, big thing. You know, I had family here that all going to school and working, and um, you know, and, and and the libraries has been like that as well. I mean, you know, it's to me, it's this huge family of friends and coworkers, and you know, they. It's what makes your job enjoyable. Mm -hmm. They they really do. So um, yeah, I was looking at the list of staff employees because that's part of my job, and 
you know, determining service anniversaries and that type of stuff. And um, there are only two other people who have been here as long as I have now. Um, one is Karen Fields, and she started working in the libraries the day after she graduated from high school. Wow. So Karen and I are both the same age, so um, she's been here since 1973. And then the other one is um, Becky Hunt, um, who was over in chemistry, and I'm not sure what, I know she splits her time between two departments now, um, and she's probably been here two years longer than I have, so yeah, so it's just, it's, we're the, I'm the top three, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so, you know, the libraries is a good place for a lot of people, and so they stick around. Mm -hmm. It's so, always a good sign. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you think has changed the most? Oh my gosh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything. You know, just moving into this electronic era um, has been wild. Um, you know, when I think of checking out books with a book card and they had would have to sign their name and, you know, you did everything by hand. And then I can remember when we got the card impressed things, you know, like the cre old credit card things, you know, they would put their Purdue ID in it and we'd slide it across for the checkout cards. Mm -hmm. We thought that was a big deal, you know, because we just weren't writing all the information down. And, um, you know, just the progression from um, doing things so manually and the, you know that's like the the newsletter um it was a paper version you know I, I and then i would have to put it on a disc and take it to printing services and then they would print print it out i would mail it out campus mail and you know and then to go to the electronic version um the media when i was cataloging media you know there were no descriptions for media i had to you know, we had, I had to watch every piece that came in and, you know, wrote the description. And um, so, I mean, it's just been, you know, we start out with 60 millimeter film and then we did some beta tapes and then three quarter inch tapes and then half inch tapes and then the laser disc and now the, you know, the DVDs and just that whole progression of um, the electronics. I mean, it's just been, I mean, the card catalog. When I first went to Life Sciences, um, I helped file card catalog. You know, we'd get the cards, and so they had to go out into the, the catalog, the main catalog, and, um, you know, we don't do that anymore. I mean, I, people would come in and it's like, where, 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 where is the card catalog, you know? And it's like, well, it's all right here on the computer. And I, that was an interesting transition as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the electronic thing has been... Amazing. The other major change I would say within the libraries is just the unification of the libraries um, coming together. You know, and that really started. I feel started with um, Emily Mobley when when she, even before she was the dean. Um, Joe Dagnese was the director of libraries when I started, um, and then he passed away, and Emily moved into that, and then her position became a dean. But she's the one that I feel really started that transition of you uniting the libraries and trying to bring them into a, you know a solid unified unit um, instead of everyone having their own rules and check out things and all that stuff. Um, and I have to admit it was really difficult to do because people were so used to doing it their way um, that that some people really, really struggled with that because, you know, well, we're catering to the civil engineering department and this is what they want. Well, we're catering to the vet med school and this is what they want. So it, it was not only unifying the, the libraries, but it was also convincing each of those departments that, you know, we're doing this for the betterment of the whole university and the students and the users of our spaces and not just because we want to make life miserable for you, you know. So it, that really started with, with her um, and, you know, just continued to progress and move and, and Jim's vision of, you know, continuing that unification and um, making us feel more 
you know, unified as a, as a group. Um, and, the, and there were, and a, there was a lot of cross training that also took place, and I think still takes place within a lot of the units. So, if someone, you know, in our like a tech where there's only one person, if you know that person is ill, then what happens? You know, so now someone from engineering could go and cover for them, and um, so you know, just that progression of where the libraries was when I started and to what I see now, I think it's just been. An amazing trip, and you know, a successful one as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it yeah. sounds like an important change for the university to to recognize yes. the influence. Yes, yes, um, yes. The recognition that the library's unit over the unit, you know, within the eyes of the university, has really, really changed. Mm -hmm. um, I served on the university um, clerical and sewer staff advisory committee. Um, and it was when I was on that committee, which is a university-wide committee, you know, you learn how things work, you know, what from the bottom up to the top up, you know. Um, and so I think that was, that was really educational for me um, and gave me a better sense of why things happen the way they do. It, and when issues would come up within our, our our libraries and stuff, you know, it was easier for me to say to them, okay, look, you know, I understand what you're saying, but this is how the university deals with it. And so, you know, we, we have to wait that out. It has to go through those steps before mm -hmm. um, it gets to this final piece. So, you know, hopefully I help relay that message to to our own staff as well that that was a really great experience and then from that um with emily she we kind of had a, a staff um, group before but emily then kind of carried it further and she said okay we need a clerical service staff advisory council and so myself and and dot and um the other person isn't here anymore that was involved in it. You know, we we sat down and we took the clerical service staff university policies and a couple other policies from um, units across campus and kind of came up with guidelines for LCSAC and um, how that could all work. And uh, that, that was that was a real endeavor. But you know, we did it, and you know, Emily tweaked or changed and put her stamp of approval on it and so that's how our current LCSAC um, evolved and um, you know in some years it's more active than others and there's just so much going on that sometimes there's not enough time to really try and do some of the other things mm -hmm. so sure um, when yeah. was that that you started LCSAC oh man I can't oh, let me see it I was still downstairs so I I can get you the official dates, but it's going to be in the 90s, um, early, early 90s when mm -hmm. we started that. Um, Dot Lanzalotto was part of that um, original group as well. It's all in L.C. Sachs documentation that they have, mm -hmm. the, the first committee was, and... Um, yeah, so that that was Emily's doing as well. So there were attempts in the past, you know, um, but it seemed like they never really lasted for very long. Mm -hmm. So you know, this definitely by far has lasted and been active for as long as I can remember. So it's yeah. still very active. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. When it comes to the library spaces, what this has been the big change? <laughs> okay, so I have seen since I've been here, um, of course, the Hicks Undergraduate Library. I worked in Stewart Center down in the basement at the time that they were building that building, and it was real exciting because the building butts right up next to Stewart Center. So, I mean, you know, they were jackhammering and digging, and, and Stewart Center, the building, you know, was vibrating, and it was, it was a little interesting to have that all happen. So that, and of course, before I came on as full-time, my senior year, 
um, the six engineering libraries moved into Potter um, building to the uh, Sigsman Engineering Library. Um, another funny story about that is they hung a portrait in there of the donors for the library and beautiful oil painting hanging there and I said, I must have weird thoughts, but I'm like, oh, that is the coolest painting. I said, but you realize it won't be long and there'll be mustaches on those. They're like, well, they wouldn't do that. That's an oil painting. And I'm like, okay, whatever you think. Well, within a month, mm -hmm. guess what? There were mustaches on it. So they had to have it restored. And then they finally put glass over there. They're like, well, you know, you're not supposed to put glass over oil paintings. But I'm like, well, you know, whatever. So anyway. Um, so that was the first big major change um, was Potter and then the Hicks Undergraduate Library. Um, and then, of course, Archives and Special Collections was a big one. Um, the Parish Management Library was, was a big thing. Um, and in that, you know, we, those were kind of all new remodeled spaces or new spaces. Um, and in that time, we closed the CFS library and the psychology library and integrated those into HISI. Um, when I was in life sciences, uh, we eventually closed biochemistry. And just as I got there, they had combined the forestry and horticulture libraries into life sciences. Um, and then, let's see, so, and of course now with um, the WALC, the Wilmoth Active Learning Center, and moving those six libraries into that building. Uh, an interesting note, I think, in that space, that area, in ENAD, the, one of the buildings they tore down that sat next to the power plant, was the Nuclear Engineering Library. And it was up on the second floor. And I worked in there quite often, and again, a space where faculty and graduate students had keys because they had offices around the library oh. space. It was just a big room and then the library, and then there was all these office spaces. And so I would go and I would work like between the semesters or holidays or whatever, and I'd be sitting there in the evening and I'm like, okay, where is everyone? Well, it was a holiday, so they'd lock the building and I'm sitting there at work going, okay, nobody can get into the library, so that's really interesting. <laughs> but what I think is really interesting, is there was a library in that space to begin with, you know, mm -hmm. years ago. And so now there's, again, a library in that same location, in that same space. So I think it's kind of cool how, it, you know, the library kind of dissolved into one and, and now it's come back to that same space mm -hmm. so just one of my freaky thoughts <laughs> that is cool it's the same materials too it, that yeah used to be there. yes yes so some of the very same materials mm -hmm. yeah yeah just wandered around a little, a little bit, bit yeah way. yeah mm -hmm. yeah went from there to potter to to the walc so yeah mm -hmm. yeah kind of the goss collection used to be um in enan too at one point um before it was moved the Goss collection kind of traveled because it was over in Craner Library as well, and there, and then Potter, and so yeah, so mm -hmm. lots of changes. Yeah, and they'll <laughs> continue to come. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your student years again, okay. aside from the libraries. Okay. What were you involved in on campus? Um, I lived off campus with my brother. Um, we were both here on, um, we were Hoosier Scholars at the time. I don't know if they, the program even still exists. So it paid our tuition. So in order to save money, he and I shared an apartment together. And it was really interesting because my mom came and she found the apartment for us. And people were really hesitant to rent an apartment to a brother and sister. They just thought that was really weird. And mom was like, now why is that, What? Uh, why would that be any stranger than two strangers renting an apartment together, you know, or whatever. So anyway, she did find an, a, an, an apartment for us and, and we shared that apartment. Um, so not having, he had lived in Cary Quad for two years. So he kind of had that connection, you know, with different campus things, but. Me never having lived on campus, 
it was a little harder to become involved in, in activities. And of course, I worked a lot of hours, so that kind of restricted that too. But I became, I did become involved with a program through Carry Quad. Um, so we did a lot of things at Christmas time for um, the underprivileged kids in the area and you know food drives and, and that kind of thing um, the really the only other activities that I well I, I worked a little bit with the debris but not a lot and um, there were a couple art you know organizations and club type things that I became involved with but otherwise I was not real involved with a lot of um, outside Activities. I worked mostly, mm -hmm. you know, because that's how. And I have to say, I made it through college four years with no loans. Paid my way through, um, and and my like I said, my scholarships paid my tuition. My first year tuition, I remember being around a hundred and seventy-five dollars a semester. When I graduated, it was five hundred dollars a semester. Wow. And when I would tell our student wor workers that, they'd look at me and they'd go, man, how old are you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of laughing. And I said, but you also have to remember that minimum wage was $1.35. So, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot of money now compared to what you pay, but compared to what, you know, minimum wage is now and to what it was when I first started, you know, it's, it's really changed. Mm -hmm. um, but I, can rem I, I graduated without any debt. Um, I was able to to get through, and my art supplies were expensive. I mean, books are expensive, period. But but my art supplies were really really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got married my junior year, um, second semester. Um, so that was a little different too. You know, a lot of a lot of kids weren't married at that point. Um, and so, you know, I never lived on campus. It was always off campus. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, was, it was just a different environment and mm -hmm. atmosphere. Yeah. 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 Did I you didn't party like a lot of college kids <laughs> did. <laughs> I just didn't. Yeah, you could, I, well, one, I couldn't afford it, you know. So uh -huh. you just, yeah. Sure. Were you ever very big into Purdue sports? You know, when I was a student, you could attend football and basketball games for free. Oh. All you had to do was take your Purdue ID and go, like they did freshman one day, sophomore one day, junior another day, and, and seniors another day. So the freshman, you know, your freshman year, you obviously got what was left over because they, you know, they proportioned out so many tickets for, for the student body. My freshman year, we used to have what they called the P block, cheer block, pep block in the stadium in ross -Aid. And so it was a card section. So we would go and, you know, we'd flip the cards and make the big displays in the stands and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big, big thing. And so we did that. And then the other big thing I can remember that I get really frustrated was the body surfing. You know, they'd lift and pass the, the kids up the, and sometimes you were just picked randomly and you're like, okay. And they'd act like they were gonna throw you over the, the back of the stadium. I mean, it was kind of freaky. But, uh, so that was a, a really big thing. And then I can remember when I was, a, my senior year then, I, I was married and I could still get basketball tickets, but I had to pay for my spouse's ticket for the season and it was $12. For the season? For the season. Wow. So he got tickets as well as, as I did. So yeah, we, I, I attended a lot of football and, and basketball games. There's nothing, nothing like an IU Purdue ball game in Mackey Arena. Everyone needs to experience that once in their life. Of course, when I was a student, Bobby Knight was the coach. So, you know, it was pretty rowdy. But um, yeah, and one of my... Uh, would it have been my senior year or junior year? I can't remember. Tom Scheffler, he played basketball at Purdue, and he was about six foot eight, and he was a creative arts major. And um, 
you know, so here's this big, tall, lanky guy, and just, you know, we'd get into class. He was very creative in, in our ceramics class and stuff. You know, it was just, it was, you just didn't think of an athlete sitting there doing all this creative stuff with his hands, but, but he, was, he was really good. I can remember they had to come get him once because he was late for the bus, the team bus, to go to a ball <laughs> game. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed the, the sports. My parents had season tickets to the basketball games, and they came to those, too. So mm -hmm. it was always nice when we had a home game because Mom would always bring food or she'd take laundry home and bring it back, you know. It was, it was great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Very convenient. Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you still attend games? I, I do not. I, I go to some of the games. I take my grandchildren. To, they particularly like well they like the football too but the basketball I would say is probably their favorite they've the last couple of summers um, have participated in the basketball camp over here and um, it's it's fun to watch because they have the basketball team members help coach these teams so I mean my seven-year-old grandson you know could run between the legs of um, Haas, and I mean, it was hysterical. But it, it, it's a lot of fun to see those kids interact with the younger kids mm -hmm. uh, and just see them out of, yeah, they're still in the basketball thing, but they're not in that competitive mode. They're, they're in that teaching mode. And mm -hmm. that's a great thing that, that they do over there. It's, it's a lot of fun. So I would go and take the boys to that. And um, it was fun. It was good to watch. It sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good program, so. That's great. Yeah. What else about Purdue as a whole, you know, on campus or in spirit, do you think you've seen change? Um, you know, our campus is pretty um, conservative. Um, I can remember in the 70s, my freshman year, maybe a little bit of my sophomore year, mostly my freshman year, which would have been 73. You know, there were, there were protests because the Vietnam War was still going on. Um, but none of them ever really got out of hand. You know, there was never any violence or anything. Um, and of course, I was usually always on my way to work. So, <laughs> you know, I really, I, well, I didn't. I didn't participate in any of them. So that was an interesting thing to see. Um, you know, and we still see some of that, I think, today, um, maybe even more so, you know, in the last five years, um, with our, our equal rights and, um, that type of thing. Um, there are a lot of, I think there's probably more, um, conservation um, interest, you know, take care of our environment type of things going on on campus. Earth Day, I don't remember when it started, but I remember when we were in Hicks, when I was in Hicks, we would, the libraries would sponsor a table for the Earth Day thing. They would do a thing out on the mall. Um, you know, the recycling and, and that type of thing. But I still see the cam our campus is, is pretty much a, a pretty conservative. I mean, they have things they definitely believe in and what they think is right and, and have that ability to voice their opinions and things. But I, I still, and, I th and that makes me proud that they can do that without being disruptive or violent, um, you know, to the community. Um, what was it when we won one of the Big Ten championships? I can remember, there, or the NCAA thing. There was a, you know, celebration, and there were, got a little carried away on campus. But, um, but overall, I'd say, you know, I, I'm proud of the way that our students handle um, different situations, you know, political and environmentally, um, that type of thing. Um, and I'm sitting here thinking as I talk about that, Carrie Quad used to sponsor what they called the Nude Olympics. Yeah. 
So that was during my era as a, as a student on campus, um, which was kind of hysterical. It was kind of funny how they tried to hush-hush it all, and then all of a sudden it becomes this big <laughs> thing. So, and I don't know if they still do it or not. I've not heard. I, I don't think they do. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Or they've gotten better at keeping, keeping it quiet. Keeping it quiet, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can remember that was a really big thing. But. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'd say Purdue's reputation as, um, you know, I've heard it referred to as the Ivy League of the Midwest and, and that type of thing. So um, it's a great rep reputation. Whenever I travel or go anywhere, I usually, you know, I have a Purdue sweatshirt or something that I'm wearing. And um, it's, it's interesting to say, oh, you're, you know, you're from Purdue. Or when I've traveled and I see a Purdue sweatshirt go by, you know, I'm like, oh, Purdue, you know, and they... So, um, yeah, it's, and that's the other thing about the libraries over the years, just the reputation of the libraries um, globally has just, it, it blows me away. Um, when, as part of my job is talking to these staff members and, and taking their photos and stuff, you know, people that come here from the South or, you know, warm climates or whatever, I always look at them and I'm like, why would you come to this environment? You know, and it's because of the reputation, you know, Purdue has mm -hmm. um, that they come, and the libraries in particular. You know, they they just have this great reputation for being innovative and moving forward, and and um, and they want to be a part of that. So mm -hmm. that makes you feel good. Yeah, it, it really does. Part of something big. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What are your interests outside of work? Oh, good, the gravy. <laughs> if there's anything you'd like to share. Um, my, we farm. My mm -hmm. husband's a farmer. Um, um, so I spend a lot of time. Um, I, during harvest season, you know, I take meals to the field and feed six guys every night. Um, and that's real interesting. Um, I have been in the tractor, and um, I do not like it, and the grain cart. I'll, I'll do it if I have to, but it's not my most favorite thing. Um, so farming takes up a lot of, of you know, your spare time, and I have eight grandchildren, and um, three of them, well, four of them are here locally. Um, so, but I have a couple that I really, really spend a lot of time with now. Um, since their mom has passed away. Um, so getting back into the groove of, you know, school programs and, you know, you, you got to be here for this and there for that and volunteer for this and volunteer for that. Um, I read a lot. Um, I have usually a book that I'm reading constantly. I like a lot of mystery, more is my thing, and, and history. I like a lot of history type stuff too. Um, I used to do a lot of count and cross stitch, a lot, but um, as my priorities have changed, I don't do it as much, but I have a project I've been working on for probably six or seven years, and I will get it done. It's I'm doing a thing of the four seasons, um, and I'm on fall, so I only got one and a half to go. <laughs> so. Um, and I love Christmas ornaments. I have an abundance of Christmas ornaments. It's kind of ridiculous, actually. Um, and I tell, I mean, not only regular Christmas ornaments, but also miniature, tiny little miniature ornaments. I finally got the ornaments on my miniature tree the other day. And I mean, there was over 300 ornaments on this crazy little tree. And I'm like, OK, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this has got to stop. <laughs> Um, but I have Christmas ornaments that were my grandmother's, so they're, you know, over 100 years old, and um, it's, I don't know where it came from, but it does, and so I just have way too many Christmas ornaments. Um, I like being outside. I like to, you know, my flowers, um, not as much my vegetable garden, but, um, but yeah, we, my husband, we do sweet corn. So we do four rows of sweet corn about a mile long. So, I mean, we're talking sweet corn. <laughs> a lot yeah. of sweet corn. <laughs> to the point where I really get sick of it. But it's all my grandkids will eat. I mean, they won't eat 
store bought and corn. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, I guess I have to do this for my grandkids. So, um, so yeah, I, our grandkids are involved in a, a lot of activities, sports and choir and band. And so I spend a lot of time doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping in retirement that I'll get to travel a little bit more. I have my family is all spread out, so um, you know, we're in Colorado and Michigan and Virginia. And um, my sister just passed away, but she was in Texas, and you know, so um, I'd like to be able to spend a little more time. One of my very best friends since kindergarten lives in, in Arizona, and um, so you know, I'm hoping that. Either my husband will go with me, or he'll stay at home and let me go for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. So, but I, we are, we are really kind of homebody people. We really are. We had uh, commercial beef cattle, so that kind of limits you know mm-hmm. what you can do too. But um, calving season, oh, oh, that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting time. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I've learned a lot because I didn't grow up on a farm. So marrying a farmer was a real. Um, uh, eye-opening experience. Yeah, you learn a lot very quickly. <laughs> you do, you do, you do. You know, just you know, they always there's the farmers always have this reputation of maybe not being the smartest people on the block, but but they really the economics and you know the things that they have to be able to do to be successful is just amazing. I never question my husband when he talks about measurements, math. I mean, he just. He has to know it, and he mm-hmm. does. And so it's like, okay, I take it at your word. <laughs> so, so yeah. So this is, and of course, family—they're real important. So you have more time for all of it in retirement. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Does your upcoming retirement make you feel any more thoughtful about what you've been doing? Um. I, I don't know that it's made, well, I feel very fortunate to, to have been able to, to do what I do. Um, you know, I mean, it's just been a great, great opportunity, you know, meeting people um, and just getting to know our library family and, and the things that we do. I mean, it, 